In this video, we're going to learn about measures of variability, another form of descriptive statistics that people often want to know in addition to measures of central tendency. But before we get to any of the nitty gritty details, I want to kind of motivate why we need measures of variability with two examples. So here's two different data sets, one on the top and one on the bottom. I'll just go ahead and tell you that the mean for both data sets is 87. Now, if I were to just tell you the mean of these data, I would be misleading you a little bit because in reality the situation in each data set is quite different. If I were to plot it out, for example, you would see this difference clearly. In the top data set, all the scores are very clustered together. Everything is close, but in the bottom data set, scores are very spread out. So again, I need some way to quantify these differences and a measure of central tendency like the mean simply can't capture that alone. Here's another example. Let's say you're working for a pharmaceutical company, something like that, and you need to decide between two different medications for depression. We'll call them medication A and medication B. So let's say you did a study where you measured how much improvement happened when people took one over the other, and this is what you got. So let's say over here that higher scores mean you know, more improvement and lower scores mean little to no improvement. Well, let's kind of compare. The means in this case are the same. In both cases, people improved by about 10-ish points or so, but the variability is very different. On the left, some people benefited very greatly, whereas others really didn't benefit at all. But on the right, everyone benefits a good amount. In this case, I would personally pick medication B because it's more consistent. And so this is an example of why knowing the variability might help us to you know, make some real life decisions. So. In general, in statistics, measures of variability are ways to describe these differences statistically. They describe how scores in a given data set differ from one another, and they capture things like how spread out or how clustered together the points are, things we've been looking at already. So there are three that we're going to talk about. We have the range, standard deviation, and variance. Let's start with the range. The range is nice because it's a really simple measure of variability, of, of dispersion, of how spread out points are. It can often be calculated in 5 or 10 seconds. Here's the formula. So we have the range, R. Don't get confused later on when we learn about correlations, which are often uh, also described by R. We'll use some different subscripts to make that difference clear when the time comes. But for now, range is R. And then we have R equals H minus L. H means the highest score in the data set, L means the lowest score in the data set. So you can see that this is a very simple calculation and if we go back to the example we were working with a minute ago, we can calculate the range very quickly. So for the first data set we have 95 minus 80, so the range is 15, and in the second data set we have 150 minus 25, giving us a much larger range of 125. So in this case, I would do well to kind of report both to you. I'll tell you the mean and this measure of variability because that gives you a more full picture of what's going on. So a mean of 87 and a range of 15 describes a very different situation compared to a mean of 87 and a range of 125. So again, it's a great idea for me to report both and this is what's often done. A big limitation of the range though is that by using it, even though it's simple and it's pretty effective, you might miss a little bit of the data, a little bit of the information in your data set. And let me show you an example to illustrate. Here's a data set here. Although these uh, bars are quite high, there's really just one uh, sort of value in each bar. So we have one person who scored a 30, one person who scored a 40, and so on. Now the range here is uh, 120. It's 150 minus 30. But let's look at a second data set. In this case, the range is still 120 because our highest and lowest values are the same, but everybody's kind of over here, and there's just a couple outliers beyond that. So again, if I were to just tell you the range, I might be misleading you a little bit because you're not sure if it looks like this on the left or if the data looks like this on the right. And this is where standard deviation and variance come into play. Standard deviation, just like the name suggests, describes the standard or typical amount that scores deviate from the mean, hence standard deviation. Now we'll get into exactly what this looks like once we learn to calculate standard deviation, but I just want to show you some symbols for now. So like with means, we have different symbols to describe population standard deviation versus sample standard deviation. Population standard deviation is described by sigma, it's this sort of 
O with the uh, Elvis hair, I like to think of it as. Not to be confused with this sigma, which is a capital S. Unfortunately, they're named the same thing, which means take the sum of. We learned about that previously. This is sigma with a little s. So for a sample, standard deviation is simply described by s. So I want to take a step back and talk about why standard deviations are really useful. Whenever you have a normal curve, a normally distributed set of data, which is very common in the world, things like height, weight, and so on are all normally distributed, standard deviations have this really interesting property of telling you a lot of information about what's common and what's uncommon. So if we have zero, this is right at the mean of whatever we're talking about, right? This is the mean. Zero standard deviations away from the mean is right here. You're right at the mean. We can look at one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below, and we automatically know, just because of how standard deviations work, that 68% of people will fall within this range. We can go beyond that. We know that between two standard deviations in either direction of the mean, 95% of people will be contained. And three, you're getting really extreme, really far out, really rare, 99.7% of the data will be contained within three standard deviations in either direction from the mean. To illustrate this a little bit more, let's talk some specifics. So let's say I'm looking at IQ scores. We know a lot about IQ scores. We know, for example, the population mean of IQ is 100, and we know that the population standard deviation, sigma, is 15. So let's go ahead and draw that same sort of normal curve. We know that intelligence is normally distributed. And let's kind of take a look at what information we have just by knowing standard deviation. So average IQ is right here at 100. One standard deviation above the mean would be 115. Two standard deviations above the mean would be 130, and three standard deviations would be 145. And we could do the same in the opposite direction. One standard deviation below the mean of intelligence is 85, two standard deviations below is 70, and three standard deviations below the mean of intelligence is 55. So again, I automatically know 68% of people will fall between an IQ of 85 and 115. I also know that 95% of people will fall between an IQ of 70 and 130. And finally, that 99.7 or so will fall between an IQ of 55 and 145. So this is great to know because if you tell me you have an IQ of 146, I'm really impressed. This is rare. This is very extreme. But if you tell me you have an IQ of, say, you know, 106, something like that, uh, you know, that's fine good for you, not very impressed, right? So knowing standard deviations helps you to kind of get this extra information about a data set. So finally, we have variance. Variance is very simple. It's just the square of standard deviation. So it's the average squared deviation from the mean. Unfortunately for variance, it doesn't get its own symbols. We just take the symbols we already have for standard deviation and we put a squared because it's just squared standard deviation. So here for a population, we would call the variance in a population sigma squared. And for a sample, we would call the sample variance s squared. So in the next video, we'll learn how to calculate some of these things, but I want to at least highlight some of the formulas you're going to see. So we have four different formulas because we have standard deviation and variance, and we have the population versions and the statistic for sample versions. So for standard deviation in the population, this is our formula. Notice we have sigma on the left, and we have all this mess, which I'll get into next time. One thing I'll mention is that for all of these formulas, the numerator is called the sums of squares, SS. And we're going to learn about what the sums of squares really means in the next video. But for now, just keep that in mind. So for our sample statistic, we have this. You're going to see an S on the left here. And it's going to have some similarities, but you're going to notice a difference or two that we'll talk about in the next video. For variance, we have sigma squared. And for sample statistic version of variance, we have S squared.